puede durar, pero vamos, creo que tiene buena batería por lo menos para, no sé, 5 horas más o menos. ¿no? Sí. También depende pues, de todo lo que se le vaya enchufando, ¿no? de si se va a amplificar sonido eh, desde la base, el micrófono, la cámara. Pero vamos, que también lo bueno que tiene, que no lo he explicado, eh, viene como una especie de Kinect, no sé si conocéis esta de, como de, para darte profundidad y tiene autonomía de que en caso de que se vaya a quedar sin batería eh, a, eh, el mismo robot ha ido reconociendo los espacios para luego poder volver a la base y recargarse la base está aquí no sé dónde la de... bueno, está por aquí y con esto está en el suelo y perfectamente puede volver y se, y se recargaría coloca así y ahí ya pues se, se recargaría sola sí. Yo sé que tiene varias salidas para diferentes eh, eh, tipos de corriente. Y me pierdo, yo estoy en la parte más de software. <risa> Lo siento. Sé que se puede dar pues, diferentes corrientes, ¿no? Por ejemplo, si es para colocar un ordenador o si es para, pues, para una, una Raspberry Pi que va a menor, a menor voltaje. Pero ya lo, la parte interna ya ahí se me escapa. De las pistas 5 y 6, ¿se puede subir el volumen? también viene en ruedas, como Audrey. <risa> ¿Qué tal? Justo estamos probando. Yes, I can hear you now. Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, I can see you just fine. Um, and hello, uh, Pablo and everybody. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm controlling the um, robot and although there's some latency I can still move uh, forward a little bit I think um, or I don't know how this actually works I hope that I don't run into anybody Okay, so we have a latency for about um, five seconds um, from what I see and uh, how it moves. And um, yes, thanks for saving me from falling down. Obviously, we need 
some work on the feedback. Yeah, hello. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> yes, I'm currently kind of blind because uh, the VR camera, um, oh, it's back online. I, I can see again. Um, I'm no longer blind. Ah, this is much better. I can see everybody now. Uh, I was just looking at a YouTube live stream, which has a five second delay, but now it is um, almost instant. It's about two seconds. So this is very good and I can see everybody around uh, and I'm going to upload my side of the recording after the event so people can see what it's like uh, from my point of view. So again, hello everybody. Yes, I can hear you. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, um, so we are many hours away, right? Uh, it is uh, past midnight, it is 2 a.m. here, and I understand it's dinner time for you, and, um, but it's almost through uh, magical means that I can uh, not only see a sight uh, of the camera, which is from the back of Media Lab Prado, and I, if I were uh, watching only the YouTube live stream, then I would only see the back of your heads. But because of the VR 360 camera, I can now see um, not only everybody's face, but how Pablo is moving around me. So um, I think this gives me a much better feeling of uh, being in the same places as you and in the same mindset as you. Now, if I uh, put on the Vive here, which is a virtual reality headset uh, with the stitching software that um, you just described, then I can um, even have a um, complete view of the surroundings uh, just by getting the uh, Theta S360 signal uh, to the Vive here. But, um, well, I'm not going to do that because then you will just see like this and uh, it wouldn't be, um, it will be like two layers of robotics. So instead I will uh, watch this on the replay and then uh, experience uh, in virtual reality afterwards. And now I'm seeing uh, the two spheres of the virtual reality camera, which gives me like halfway uh, of the feeling of being in the same room as you. Yes, I've been uh, the digital minister for six weeks now uh, and uh, our team is now about 15 people 
uh, we built uh, something like um, the Etalab in France or the GT GDS in UK or the 18F or the US Digital Service in the US, we started an internal startup that is focusing on providing digital service um, to the national government. And uh, I think we are kind of unique in that we use 100% uh, free software and open source uh, development methods. So our website is on GitHub and we use every day the Sandstorm uh, tool, which is a collection of free software, libre software that we use for things like uh, Chatroom, like Kanban, like, you know, like Trello, and uh, for things like Etherpad and everything. And the magical thing is that because all my meetings, um, because I said to the premier before I joined the cabinet that I will not look at any confidential information or any uh, national secret. So this means that everything that I can see and I can hear can be made public automatically. And so uh, I've been working with a stenographer who types um, at 300 um, words per minute all the meetings that I hold or that I co-chair. And so, uh, and then we send the meeting transcript as a collaborative document to all the ministry's people who attended the meeting. And for many people, this is the first time they saw anything like a collaborative document. And so this is very important because they've been working with paper. They were high level officials all their life. And the first time they experienced collaborative document is free software and is collaborative software. And they can edit the meeting transcript for 10 days and afterwards um, it's made public. So everybody can just see on the website, pdis.tw, pdis, um, all the meetings that we have held 10 days ago. So it's like a replay of everything that I have seen and I have said and everything in a completely transparent way. And we have resolved uh, many cases like the company law, like social enterprises, uh, like the definition of e-sport um, in the national law and so on, using this kind of new method. And all the ministries are very excited because they now have a zero-cost way to deploy this kind of digital tools. That's what I've been doing. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy to meet you uh, again in the flesh. on medium.com uh, just before I become the digital minister to outline how exactly uh, I'm planning to use virtual reality uh, to improve democracy. And this talk uh, in many uh, ways is a way of continuation of the talk that I gave uh, in Madrid six months ago um, in the Democratic City event I talk about um, the way that Taiwan has moved in democracy and how we moved into a post-party politics in the sense that uh, the majority of the cabinet, there's more independent uh, ministers than there's ministers of any party. 
So this means that we are in the environment to move to a way that uh, talks about policies instead of uh, party politics. And this has been uh, a very fortunate circumstances. So uh, because I've been researching virtual reality for quite some time now, um, now I'm in a position to actually put it into, into use. Um, so what follows uh, is a basic idea of what I'm planning to use virtual reality. Some of them has already been put into action uh, by changing our procurement rules, um, basically saying that any new software uh, projects purchased by the government needs to have a what we call an open API, meaning an API that is machine-readable, maybe machine-writable, and something that people can generally just generate um, a index of whatever a system has to offer. And so because of this, we now have a lot of open data and a lot of geographic and everything um, materials that we can put into virtual reality. So that is the context. So for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, um, I'm just going to read uh, from my manifesto of sorts. So uh, virtual reality, as um, you know, it's not meant to replace human contact. It's not meant to replace the in-the-flesh face-to-face uh, -face contact but it is to provide a new way to interact, to augment. Uh, in the past, pencil and paper, telephone, audiovisual media have all played this role. But what is so special about virtual reality is that it can transcend the dimensions of time and space. It can bring a stronger sense of coexistence to participants. Just from the 10 seconds or so of me putting on a Vive and see around Media Lab Prado, uh, my emotion is now in the correct stage that I feel that I'm in the room with you. And without virtual reality, uh, this kind of common understanding or spontaneity and interaction uh, is much more difficult to cultivate. It would take much more time. So this not only improved the efficiency of communication, but it also helped us practice many democratic values in the process as we interact again and again. And this is important because in today's democracy, fostering empathy through communication has become more and more important due to the diverse backgrounds and values of the citizens. So this is especially true for government officials and agencies who don't necessarily have the same life experience as the people who are affected by their policies. Now, in the previous century, before we have, um, you know, this kind of high-speed internet connection, the most important attributes in a country's leader or a government official is judgment and professional abilities. But nowadays, because everybody can connect to everybody in high speed, the ability to build consensus may be equally, if not more, important. And so the idea of building consensus is not knowing what is the best solution uh, in the face of problems, but being able to blend the multitude of views and feelings in order to understand what issues are important to everyone and being able to find a solution with everyone that can be understood and accepted. So, to put it very concretely, when we are debating uh, from a small case like a park in the uh, region to a large case like a new airport, we may watch presentations, we can sit down in meetings, public hearings, and discuss them. But rather than doing just that, many characteristics of virtual reality would enable participants to receive a much more direct information flow and would foster an emotional connection between stakeholders. So this has six different aspects. The first is that it transcends the dimension of space because in face-to-face -face meetings, most of the materials are text, image, video, they are two-dimensional. 
but the topics themselves are often multidimensional, so this discrepancy often leads to a difference in our understanding. There are some people, not me, who are archi architects. They can just look at a design blueprint or a few simulation drawings and have the entire building, the entire interaction, the entire traffic flow, everything in their head. But um, these are a very, very rare uh, kind of talent. Most of the stakeholders, if they see the same two-dimensional drawings, they would not have the same tangible response. So then it becomes very hard to understand and to compare the pros and cons of different plants, unless there's a very clear sense of space in everybody's head. And therefore, uh, there are many people working on what we call participatory planning, have developed many ways to hear more opinions using life models, uh, sketch presentations, group creations, even electronic decision theaters uh, in Arizona University. But these uh, are kind of expensive. To build a one-to-one -one scaffolding of a park may take a week. To build a one-to-one -one scaffolding of an airport is impossible. So using virtual reality to help with the proceeding can save cost, can increase participation, and even more importantly, help very young participants to provide useful and meaningful suggestions. And uh, as another concrete example, when I was in Paris, I gave the first VR interview with six children in Taiwan. And we did it in virtual reality with everybody wearing the uh, virtual reality headset. And I witnessed something that is very important um, because in virtual reality, the children can change how high they are. Sometimes they, when they want to talk with me, they, in the virtual reality, change them, their models to be the same height as me, so that we see each other eye to eye, and in a way that treat each other as equals. If we are in uh, the flesh, then they will be about half my height, and they have to look up. And this actually changes the psychology of speaking. So not only the children can interact with adults and they said after the meeting that they feel much more confident to talk to a minister who are at the same height as them, but also that we can also see the building in the children's view and ensure that everybody is on the same page. <clears throat> and secondly, even though we can record audio or video in a traditional discussion, the way we replay it is as a video, right? A two-dimensional video. But VR allows us to record a scenario in three dimensions and from multiple perspectives. In other words, VR allows participants who were absent the first time, they were not there, but they can also enjoy the vivid feeling of being in the same meeting by returning to the scenario later. And this will expand the effectiveness of the discussion and allow more people to experience in the same scenario the process of reaching into a consensus. So it's not about just the 50 people in the public hearing who reach consensus, but anyone who wears this headset or see it in three dimension projections can also feel the same consensus forming experience. And this improves uh, mutual understanding. And the third, of course, it liberates ourselves from the limitations of distance and space. By entering a virtual space, participants do not need to actually be present at the flesh, so it saves the cost of travel and reduces carbon emission of air travel. Um, and the characteristics of virtual space also eliminate the concerns. For example, if a public hearing space is large enough to uh, accommodate all the stakeholders. In the meantime, it can also balance the national perspective and the local cultural context because people around the world, people around the country can all join in exactly the county or the township that is being discussed. And so this is not just the short-term influence of spatial reconstruction. In the long run, I think this will change this configuration of our physical spaces. For example, when more and more important meetings of a local government are held using the help of VR, then every discussion arena can be the political nexus 
at that point of time, instead of fixed division between the central metropolis area and the outskirts, the townships. Of course, this kind of communication technology is still early, and this reconfiguration of city and outskirt dynamic will require decades of dialogue and adjustment. But I think this is a future development very much worth watching. The fourth is the equal room of listening. Because in VR, as I mentioned, people are present basically identical in appearance. So not only does reduce the power imbalance caused by the height or age, as I explained, but also gender, skin color, and everything uh, can be somewhat corrected in this way. And in a space where equality is respected, because it's impossible to harass uh, people in the same way as you could in the flesh, we can change the acoustics, we can change the physics to make it impossible to harass each other. So people can be more focused on listening to the diversity of opinions that are present instead of just focusing on a few influencers. And this will help to end the problems caused by the tendency of judging people by what they wear, by their appearance, or deliberately ignoring due to people who are unfavorable. Uh, but then, in this kind of space, we can preserve the collective wisdom of hundreds of thousands of years of face-to-face -face communication. But we can also expand it so that it can accommodate thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, like in the Agora, but infinite. And the fifth, of course, there is also a practical side of it. Because after smartphones, VR is now widely seen as one of the few areas that can be attached to a smartphone and make a breakthrough in applied technology today. And Taiwan is an island that produces VR equipment and provides digital content. Um, as a digital minister, I'm very much willing to properly utilize contributions from the private sector and from the civil society on this area. And because this has been my research topic in recent years, uh, it will become definitely one of my major priorities. And finally, thanks to the overview effect, and I think this is very important, because um, just today I gave an interview uh, with a local um, television broadcaster, and when she joins me in uh, the virtual reality, I first invited her to fly out of Taiwan, fly out of Taipei, to fly into the outer space, and see us uh, from space. Because when we are on the ground, the cloud makes us not see the stars. But when are, we are in the stars, uh, we are in awe. This is awesome, meaning that it fills us with awe. And when we're filled with awe, psychologically speaking, we are much more pro-social. We're much more willing to listen to people who are different because, well, it's the same globe. And from outer space, you cannot see the division between the countries and territories and everything, there's a very uh, strong sense of togetherness. And this is called the overview effect. Basically, people who become astronauts come back to us to become better people. And this is um, basically how we can observe the influence caused by every policy and every movement from the viewpoint of the whole city, the whole society, and the global scale. And this creates a brand new model of collaboration. And also very practically, traditional diplomatic encounters involve many limitations and many norms. However, VR can also provide more opportunity to conduct exchange under conditions of openness and equality, paving a new pathway through current obstacles. Um, for example, in Taiwan, because Taiwan's relationship with United Nations is not that um, uh, normal. Um, in multilateral meetings, oftentimes, as a minister, um, I cannot participate. But there is no multi-stakeholder uh, forum that I cannot participate. And even in multilateral events, they, there's nothing saying that people cannot watch uh, a movie of a minister or that a double, a robotic double of a minister cannot be present uh, on a multilateral meeting. So this is, again, a new pathway through the current diplomatic obstacles.